salvation, really. Of course, that's where it all starts when you get saved, right? Amen. And then after you get saved, you know what will happen? The devil will come along and he'll try to confuse you and sidetrack you. He did everything he could to keep you from getting saved in the first place. But then if you get saved, then he wants to do everything he can to keep you from serving God. And so he'll get you, try to get you to doubt your salvation. And so last week we talked about actually the believing, putting your faith and trust in Jesus, getting saved. And then this week we're going to talk about security. Amen. And uh, so that's uh, my text, our key verse last week. Anybody remember what that was? Well, don't feel bad sometimes. I can't remember what I preached last week either. But it was John 3.36, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 36, he says, He that believeth in, on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so I talked about how you, what's a believer? It's somebody that just puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's talking about that here in this verse. I think that was the key to the whole sermon. And so we just put our faith and trust in Jesus and believe that He came and died on the cross, paid for our sins, rose again, went back up to heaven. He's interceding for us now. And there's a battle goes on. Once you get saved, the devil's going to start to attack you more and more. Uh, some people give you the idea, well, once you get saved, you won't have any more problems. Well, sometimes I think you have more yeah. because before the devil didn't care about bothering you too much other than he just didn't want you to get saved. But once you got saved, then the battle really uh, kicks in. Now this week, if I have a key verse, it's 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. Both of those verses would be worth memorizing. At the very least, marking them in your Bible or taking a note. Amen. Uh, I'm not going to turn. I, I stayed up till 4 o'clock this morning writing every verse out by hand. And so I'm not going to flip through the Bible. I'm just going to read them to you. So if you want to keep up with it, you better get you a pencil and piece of paper. Because some people get upset because I go too fast, they think. Although I talk awful slow for a northerner. I was born and raised mainly, mainly in Indianapolis. But uh, 1 John 5.13 says, These sayings have I written unto you that believe on the, Son of, uh, on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the Lord name of the Son of God. Can you know you're saved? Yes. Well, most Christians don't know it. You know, main churches that teach uh, security? Baptist and Presbyterians. Yes. And the Presbyterians do it because it's, they're into election predestination and that kind of stuff. They call it Reformed Doctrine if you want a fancy uh, term for it. But... And then, of course, you know what we always get accused of? I'll tell you what we get accused of. Well, you just believe you can get saved and do anything you want. Yeah. You ever heard that one? Mm -hmm. Do you really believe that? No. No, because if you start doing anything you want, the Lord's going to start spanking you. <coughs> do you make your kids mine? Or try to? Well, the Lord will. You ever had the Lord get after you? If you haven't, you're probably not saved. What? Well, that'd be, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation because I want you to be secure. But as I've gone, and I, I've gone door to door quite a bit over the years, and uh, a lot of people believe that if they get saved and then they sin, then they're going, they could lose their salvation. But if they believe that, they're thinking wrong because it's eternal everlasting life right <laughs> and once you get it how long is it going to last forever 
for eternity or forever. Well, somebody says, oh, that's too simple. Well, I'm glad God makes it simple so even I can understand Amen. it. Anybody can. But if you're trying to work your way to heaven, you're, you will never get to heaven by working your way to heaven. But after you get saved, you ought to love the Lord enough to do something for Him. And so I think that's a pretty important thing. And like I say, many people believe they can lose their salvation if you get in sin. Going door to door, uh, I've talked to a lot of people, uh, and I'll ask them, do you believe if you were to die, you'll go to heaven? And the answer I get, mo most common answer is, well, I'm trying, I hope so. And I really don't think that's a very good answer. Right. If they're really saved, they ought to say, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Amen. Matter of fact, we, I asked the nurse down at the doctor's office, uh, what day was that? Thursday? And I asked her that, and she said, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I asked the lawnmower guy that. And he shocked me because he cusses quite a bit. And, and uh, I said, you know, we're not getting any younger. And I, I said, what's going to happen when you die? And he said, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Just like that. Now, I, I like that when somebody talks that way. I'd rather do that than say, well, I'm trying real hard, and maybe if I hang on long enough, I might make it. It doesn't depend on you hanging on. The Lord's got you in His hand. And you can't get out. Matter of fact, when Noah went in the ark, God closed the door. He was in there until the water went down. And then God told him to come in. Then He tells him to go out. Well, you ought to come in to Jesus. The ark's safety, right, is Jesus' safety. And then after we get through the hard time, then go out and did it tell somebody about Jesus and how God saved you. Did He save Noah? Yes. And his family? Amen. Um. So I said, oh, well, no, it didn't do a very good job. Well, he got his family saved. Man, he's talking this morning. I heard a preacher at the fellowship meeting Tuesday, and he hit on that thing with Elijah, where Elijah's saying, well, I'm the only one that hadn't bowed his knee. And God says, I have 7,000. <laughs> right in the middle of the house. So was there more than 7,000? Is that more than 450 prophets of Baal? Yes, it is. Now, how do, where, how do you think most of that 7,000 got saved? Who do you think was preaching? A fellow named Elijah. Yeah. He, went, he was getting something done, didn't even know it, I think. But no, he was afraid of Jezebel. Because right. she up. said she was going to kill him. But God was on his side. God took care of him. Amen. But we look at these things that... Like I say, I love it when somebody's got their, their secure in their salvation. Can't do much for God if you're working all the time trying to keep yourself saved. <laughs> D.L. Moody said he'd never seen a Christian that was very good in the service of God that wasn't sure that he was saved. That's right. Because you're too busy trying to keep yourself saved. You're working real hard at it. Uh, we ought to be working that hard at trying to get somebody else saved. But if you can get your, uh, that settled, that you are saved and you're on your way to heaven, then, then you can start trying to help other people get to heaven too. And of course, you know who we first start out trying to work with, and some of them are the hardest, our own family and close friends, people we work with, the people we're around, the people that we care about the most. It's not we don't care about everybody. I'd like everybody to get saved. God would too. Is it 1 Peter 3 9? Amen. 2 Peter. 2 Peter. He's not slack concerning his promise, uh, as some men are, but he's long suffering toward us and not willing that any should perish. perish. Amen. At all. So God wants them all to get saved, but he doesn't make them get saved. If you get into this election stuff and Calvinistics, oh, he makes them. Well, I heard about two guys got in a a church picnic, you know, and they, and they had a one drumstick and they got in a fight over it. And the one guy said, I'm predestinated to have this drumstick. And the other said, no, I'm predestinated. And I, all these people that are predestinated, they're all going to go to heaven. I never have found one of them that was lost. 
It's very interesting. Uh -huh. When I first come to Noblesville, I had a guy in the church that was pretty strong on that. He misquoted verses and quoted parts of verses to back up what he said. But first point, if you want a point of my sermons here, I don't have but three, I believe. Of course, uh, we'll see. God, God promised and produced eternal life. Did He promise you eternal life or not? And if God promises, you think He can keep His promise? And there's all kinds of Scripture uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Was Jesus lifted up on the cross? Did Moses lift a brass serpent up in the wilderness? The snakes were biting them. They were dying. said, look and live. We sing that song, look and live. Uh, look to Jesus and live. And then it goes on in those verses in uh, John 3, uh, 14, 16, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Did He make you a promise there or not? Yes. And He goes on, He says eternal life. Then He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. Eternal life, everlasting life. I, I read about it difference in the two, but I'm not going to get into that. I can get myself in trouble if I get too deep sometimes. And uh, if you want to all I get you a big theology book. I got a few of them. I don't really like reading them. I'd rather read my Bible. Amen. He says, so that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only did He promise you eternal and everlasting life, says you're not going to perish. You're not, you're not going to go to hell. You're not. Titus 1-2 says, and they had this in front of the, where I went to Bible college, a big stone out front. It's Titus 1-2 carved out in stone. And hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now who was back there uh, at, uh, before the world began? God. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think they had a little conference. And they set up a, a plan for saving mankind. I think the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, you, you can go in your Bible. Uh, of course, well, what is it? Uh, Genesis 1.26, Let us make man in our image. But then at the Tower of Babel, God's up in heaven. He said, let us go down. and confound. They confounded their languages. Uh, they were all trying to build a one world government. They're back at it. They've always wanted to have a one world government. There will be one. But it won't be Jesus over that first one. That's right. It'll be the Antichrist. And uh, a lot of people will follow him. First John 2.25 says, And this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal right. life. How many times does he have to say it? In those verses I've just quoted. That's just a small amount. If you just had one or two or three, and I've probably got four or five or six now. And I'm not done yet. John 10, chapter 27, or chapter 10, verses 27 to 30 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they uh, follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Somebody I said, I can jump out. Are you a man? Yeah, when I well, I talked to a fellow who thought he could lose salvation out of the church of Christ. And that's what he told me. Well, I could jump out. I said, no, you can't. Not if you're really in his hand. That's right. But you better make sure you're in his hand. Now, if you're in his hands, you're safer than being in all states' hands. Amen. We got all state insurance. They keep raising our rates, don't they, Carol? <laughs> I'm not done yet. I don't want to stop. A, uh, usually we stop at 29. But I want to give you some more here. I want to get down to 30. It says, My Father which gave them me is greater than all. Now, who's going to outfight God? Not even the Antichrist. But yet, if you study in Revelation, it says, well, who can stand up against the Antichrist? I know somebody that can stand up against the Antichrist. 
And I know who's going to come out on top too. Do you know? What do you know? Do you know you're saved? Are you secure in it? Well, I think the more you get in your Bible and the more you go to church and the more you pray, probably the more secure you'll be. That's right. But some churches, they teach false doctrine. That's not to go into the doctrine that gives you the wrong medicine. <laughs> doctrine is Bible teaching. Isn't it? And uh, uh, to get cured from your sins, you need to be taught that you're a sinner and that Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for your sins. And if you'll trust Him and believe in Him and put your faith in Him, then you'll get eternal everlasting life. That's right. And the Bible teaches it so plainly. As just read through the Gospel of John, and by the time you get done, I don't see how you can not know how to get saved. I may agree with that. Well, if you read the Bible, you know I'm on pretty safe ground, right? Then he goes on. He says, "My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand." And then in the last verse, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. One. Is there a trinity? Is the Father and the Son both God? Then I think we can throw the Holy Spirit in there too, don't you? Uh huh? But those verses pretty well teach that. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Isn't that what it says? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I told you Genesis 1, 26 says, Let us uh, make man and create man in our image. And then in... Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11 verse 7 says let us go down and confound their languages and well who's talking to each other there well I think there's three I'm talking Father Son the Holy Spirit let us is us more than one yes. when well, we know at least it's the Father and the Son because Jesus said we're one didn't he didn't I give you a verse somebody says you want what uh, it might have already forgot it. I guess I better go back and find it again. Uh, I think it would be verse John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and my Father are one. Is that plain enough? Yeah. He, he says, Father are one. Then the way to sin, I gave you those verses. And... Uh, so now I think I'm ready for page four. So they said, how many pages you got? Well, hang on, you'll find out. <laughs> I think it's around eight. But I'm already up to four. That means I'm halfway through, right? I'm good. <laughs> you know, God promised and produced eternal life. Did he or didn't he? Yes. Did he promise it? There's no doubt about that. Who else could produce it? We're in God's hands. Think that's pretty good hands to be in? Well, He created everything, including you and the whole world. Didn't He? Think He could work out a way of getting us into heaven? Well, apparently He did. He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to pay for our sins so we could go to heaven. And, uh, you know, Believers are kept by God. They do not keep themselves. Well, when you're trying to work your way into heaven, you're trying to keep yourself saved. Isn't that what you're doing or not? If my good doesn't outweigh my bad, I'm not going to make it. But well, show me that in the Bible. You can't show me that in the Bible. It doesn't say that. Does it? I've never found it. And I've read the Bible through over 20 times. I think I would have found it. Maybe I could. You know, I don't think I would have probably marked that. I didn't find that. Now I talked to about how Jesus made a way for us to get saved. And the Father made a way and the Holy Spirit works on us. And somebody says, you got any scripture for that? Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 says, 
For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Now Paul's talking there. He says, I'm not ashamed of getting put in prison. I'm not ashamed of being beaten with a rod of, a rods and with cat of nine tails and stoned and uh, shipwrecked and night and a day in the sea. And he talks about all that. Paul went through a lot. He pulls his coat bag and says, look at the marks. Yeah. I got some bruises. I got some scars. I'm not ashamed of that. I think, matter of fact, he was thrilled that he was that God would let him do that so people could get saved. And he says, For the, the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. day. Wonder what day he's talking about. <laughs> Think Jesus is coming back? Amen. Will that be a day? Well, when you get caught up and be with the Lord, will that be a, quite a day? I think you get excited. I think even Baptists will get excited. But I've seen some Baptists get excited in camp meetings. and I, I've seen them get so excited and so loud you couldn't hardly hear the preacher for them yelling amen and praise the Lord. And, but usually we're kind of quiet people. Maybe we ought to get louder. The world needs somebody to get loud. Man. They want you to go over and sit there in the corner and shut up. Don't tell them about Jesus. You know, you won't be politically correct or you won't be woke enough if you start doing that stuff. <laughs> Philippians 1 6 says, being, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. If he starts it, he's going to finish it. That's right. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Am I going fast enough on the verses? So I'm not having to flip through the pages. Brother Brown says you ought to write all these out. I used to type them, but my typewriter's out in the, And I can't do it on a computer. I can't get the spacing. It just drives me crazy trying to figure out how to do that. Maybe one of these days I'll learn. I guess that they need to teach you the whole dog new tricks, right? Uh, Hebrews 12, chapter, or verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Is he the author and the finisher? The author is the guy that started the thing, right? And not only did he start it, he's going to finish it. If he saves you, is he going to take you to heaven? Author and finisher. And, uh, of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross think it was fun going to the cross well how, how can he get any joy out of that he got joy out of it because he was saving his kids you're his kids if you could say if your children were dying would, and you could save them would, that, would you get some joy out of that even if it hurt you well didn't Jesus why did, why did he get joy out of it? Because he loved you. He loves us. Sometimes we, the devil comes along and says, God doesn't love you. But yes, he does. Amen. The cross, this despising the shame, he had to take all our sins on himself on the cross. He'd never ever sinned. Would you like it if somebody accused you of sinning and you'd never ever sin? They falsely accused you. Did they falsely accuse Jesus? Yes. They even paid some liars off. Sound like some of the politicians today. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say that. Or should I? No, we had to have all these things goes on and says, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where's Jesus at today? He's sitting up there beside the Father. Uh, he's on the right hand. I wonder if the Holy Spirit might be on the left. Did you know Jesus? <laughs> the little boy was going home. I think it's Jack Hyle's son said, uh, you, you, you know God's... Uh, uh, left-handed. 
Then they said, well, how do you know he's left-handed? Because, because God's sitting on his right hand. Or Jesus sitting on his right hand. So he has to be left-handed, right? Isn't that good reasoning? It's like the little girl said to Gritton that the uh, uh, moon's made out of green cheese. And uh, Dad says, well, can you prove that from the Bible? She goes up to her room, starts getting her Bible out. She comes down and says, yeah, the cow, the uh, moon was made and the, the cows were made before the moon, so. <laughs> well, that was her reasoning. Some things that's so plain to the Bible, you don't have to do much reasoning, you just believe it. Right? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God. Then I'm down to my third point. Man. I think we'll get out of here by quarter tail or ten tail, maybe. Jesus died for all of our sins. Amen. And he didn't just die for some of them, he died for all of them. Does the Bible teach that or not? Well, let's see if we can find any verses. First Peter chapter two and verse twenty-four says, Who is his own who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree? that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. We were healed by Jesus dying. Did he, pay, did he pay for our sins by suffering on the cross or not? Well, like I say, 1 Peter 2.24 says he did. Sure does. Now, I'm up to the sixth page of my notes. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone uh, turned away, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He laid all of our sins for the whole world on Jesus. Isn't that something? And we've all we're all sinners, says right there in the first part. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have turned away. And people turn away from God, but they need to turn back to God. They need to repent of their sins. They need to agree with God that they're a sinner. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't die on the cross to pay for His sin. Whose sin did He die on the cross to pay for? For us. Now what the Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Somebody says, well, I'm a pretty righteous guy. Well, you got to be careful about self-righteousness. What you need is God's righteousness to put into you. And that's what happens when you get saved. Matter of fact, if you're self-righteous, you could get that'd be a sin of pride, possibly, wouldn't it? Boy, look what I did. I don't think you're going to get to heaven and stick your thumbs in your suspenders and walk around and say, "Look what I did to get up here." I think you'll look over and see Jesus with the scars in his hands and say, "Look what he did to get me up here." Don't you think that's the way to work? And so we got to get Jesus in the right place and ourselves in the right place. And a uh, uh, little boy was standing beside the road and a uh, fellow was lost and he pulls up beside him and uh, he asked this uh, little boy some questions here. He says, he asked the little boy, he says, how do you get to the town? The little boy said, I don't know. And uh, they asked him another question. He says, uh, where's route number uh, route 20? The boy said, I don't know. And uh, he said, well, where's this road go to? And the little boy said, I don't know. And the fellow says, well, son, you don't know anything, do you? He said, well, I know I ain't lost. <laughs> do you know you're not lost? Huh? Well, you're on the road. Where are you headed? You headed to heaven? You going to get there? Well, I think we got a better GPS than anything you can buy today, don't you? You know, the Holy Spirit's up there looking down on us, guiding us. 
Does it help to have somebody to guide you? Of course, you got the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Don't you? If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, do you have any security? Is Jesus up there mediating for you on the right hand of God the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, works in our heart and comes alongside us and helps us and if we need to uh, take a stand and tell somebody about Jesus, the Holy Spirit knows us, helps us know what to say and how to say it. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? You know, I think that's a good thing to know. I know I'm not lost. Do you know you're not lost? Of course, this isn't the same kind of lost, is it? Well, I am kind of wandering around in this world. You wandering around? Are you pilgrims just going through? You're not going to stay here, are you? We're just passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And, and you get less, as close you get to the Lord, less you'll feel at home in this world. It's going to get better. Isn't it going to get better? But be thankful for what you have now. Shouldn't we be thankful? Has God done anything good for you in this life right now? Well, Casey came in a few weeks ago. He said, seven, seven, seven weeks. Or I think that's what you said. I looked at him. Seven weeks? What's he talking about? Now, he knew what he was talking about, but I didn't know yet. What he was trying to tell me was, that he was seven months into the pregnancy, going to have a baby. He was all excited about it. We need to just keep praying for her and the baby. Don't we? And Kay, pray for Casey too. He needs to be a good dad. Doesn't he? Yes, sir. And then they got a good family around them on both sides. I met some of them. It's good to have a family. You know, the devil's trying to his best to destroy the family. He really is. He's working real hard at it. We need to have families. I don't think the devil will ever get rid of the family. No. He's done a good job of messing a lot of them up. No. Divorce, homosexuality, no. transgender stuff. That's all mm -hmm. sin, really. Somebody says, well, you shouldn't talk that way. I'm not. I believe the Bible teaches it. You can find it in the Bible. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah got burned up? How come? What was it all about? Then I got another verse I want to go to here. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. Let's see. I wrote that uh, on page 8. Because I wrote it and I didn't have room, and so I scrunched it up and I couldn't read it, so then I rewrote it last night or this morning. 1 John 5, verses 11 through 13 says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Is Jesus the main part of your salvation? Putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. But what happens then when they attack Jesus and say, I he wasn't really God. He's just a good man. He's just a teacher. No, he was God in flesh. Virgin born, never sinned one time. I've already read some scriptures that backed that up, didn't I? And I'll read some to you. He that hath the Son, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. That's talking about eternal life, everlasting life. We've all got physical life, don't we? Are you here? You know, some people don't even know if they're here. That's true. We, yeah, they talk that way. Talk that way. It's, it's silliness to me. Then verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, that's my sermon. 
Do you need to believe on the name of the Son of God? Will He keep you secure, or are you trying to do it for yourself? Uh, I, I think the Lord's more powerful than you'll ever be. Who can stand up against the Lord? Well, the Antichrist will try, but he's going to lose the battle. Let's all stand.